Come back to order, please. Are there any other requests? Okay. Are there any other requests to take any items out of order? Hearing none, we'll go back to the consent agenda. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And the consent agenda, we just want to congratulate two staff members who have announced their retirement. Jackie Becker, Olins, SLP at Stanley, will retire effective July 15th. And Mary Jo Vasquezi, who is a secretary in the mm. CTE department at the high school, retires effective 228, so just uh, a week Soon. and a half or so away. So we want to thank both of these folks for their service to the Waltham Public Schools and wish them well in their retirement. Uh, also, you'll notice there are two resignations, one parental leave extension, and that is all that is in the consent agenda. Any comments on the consent agenda? Mayor McCarthy. I just want to say it won't be the same without Mary Jo Vasquez. I know. That's she treated answer. all of those children yeah. as if they were her own. And I want to thank her for all her love and affection over the years to all the kids. And she always made sure to take care of them, whether they were late, whether they were this. She was right there pushing them along to make successful lives. Thank you, Mary Jo. Anyone else? Seeing none. Uh, let's see. Uh, communications, Dr. Regan. Am I right? Yep. They need a vote Staff request. Consent agenda. They need to vote the consent agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. Yo, we yeah, did not vote on that. Right, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Move yeah. approval of the Thank consent you, agenda. Thank you, Ms. Al Jamal. Was that? Yes. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Ms. Donnelly. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Okay. Communications. All right, thank you. Uh, as you know, annually, uh, staff members who wish to bring their students to the Waltham Public Schools, these are staff members that do not live in Waltham, um, are asked to put a request in front of the school committee for your consideration. Uh, in your packet, you see that there are 11 total requests at this time, nine at our elementary schools, one at the middle school, one at the high school. Um, I can tell you in terms of seats and space, uh, we can accommodate those, those children. Uh, if you do approve them but as you know um, we particularly at the elementary middle schools where we have choices we place them in the buildings where there is the, the most space at that grade level and these staff members know that so uh, we'd be looking for you to approve this list of 11 uh, this evening move approval second any discussion on the motion all those in favor aye, aye. aye. all those opposed the ayes have it all right, and next under communications, uh, we have the DESI mask mandate and its intersection with the local school committee policy on face coverings. Uh, as you know, and as we've talked about tonight, as of February 28th, the mandate will end at the state level. Uh, masking in schools will then be determined at the local level. Uh, the DESI has also eliminated the minimum vaccination rate, uh, which used to be in place where they said you need to be at 80% vaccination rate in order to lift mask mandate in an individual school. That will be gone effective February 28th as well. Uh, masks will still be required in school on school buses. That is a federal mandate as of now in school health offices. So we'll have masks uh, required in nurses offices. Uh, and still at this point, um, when students return to school after being out with, or staff return to school after being out with COVID-19, uh, they should be masked for five days upon their return. Um, so I bring this before you tonight, and it's actually timely because when that mandate expires, uh, your local uh, policy that you adopted in September uh, continues uh, to be sort of the law of the land here in, in the Waltham Public Schools. Um, so I, as I put in my memo, my recommendation to you is to consider rescinding policy EBFCA, which is your face mask policy, effective March 7th. Uh, and this will be provided that the citywide mandate is lifted, which I understand is lifted once the um, positivity rate falls below 2%. Um, I'm also asking if you would consider authorizing the superintendent to reinstate masking if the city's Board of Health reinstates the citywide mandate or if the DESI requires masking again. Um, I'm asking for that because then I wouldn't have to uh, mobilize the school committee and get a vote uh, I would just follow suit with those two agencies the local and the state um, if we go to the 7th it gives us one week beyond the February vacation um, 
history has shown us that cases tend to go up immediately following a school break or holiday. I think this is a responsible way to look at this. Um, and, you know, it's an extra five days. I know that folks that want the masks removed immediately uh, may find that to be problematic, but given how long we've been living with the masks, um, I think an extra five days is not too much to consider if we want to monitor how cases are going after the break. Um, anyone wishing to wear a mask, if you should rescind your mask, obviously would be allowed and supported in doing so. Um, we would make sure that schools are particularly aware of those students that uh, have parents that want them to continue to wear a mask and support them in that. Um, obviously the same for staff members. Um, I do want to note that as you're thinking this through before I turn it back over to you, um, you know, just to look at some of the local case data, uh, you can see that large spike right after the winter holiday break and it's just been a considerable drop. Uh, we only have five, it says four, we have five actually cases this week so far and it's Wednesday. So we're tracking this week to be even lower than we were last week. Um, and in the city side, you can see the, the you know, mirrored drop in uh, case counts since the peak after the holidays. This chart as well. And then here's the positivity rate hovering above two point, just above two and a half percent. Um, so uh, the last thing I would just ask you to uh, consider as you're deliberating what to do with the local policy, uh, we have purchased, well, first, I'm sorry, uh, we have about 2,000 or so participants in the weekly at-home testing program. Uh, that's, that's great, and that will continue at least through April 22nd, 2022, according to the state. Um, and then I wanted you to know that we also purchased uh, a two-pack COVID testing kit for every family and every staff member, and we will distribute those on the 17th or 18th of February prior to the break. This is not required, um, but we're providing this service for families, and what we're gonna ask them to do, if they'd like to participate, is test on the 27th of February before they return to school, and then as an added precaution, they could test the 6th of March, the following Sunday. So we'd have two weeks where we would have the ability to have people just test themselves at home and the effort there would just be to keep those that are positive out of the school building, particularly as we're transitioning, if you vote to do so, uh, away from the mask mandate. Um, so I just put that in there as uh, informational as you're uh, debating uh, what to do next with the mask policy. And that's, that's you, my Mr. Coleman, I have actually a lot of questions for you. Um, the five days that a child would be wearing a mask at school after they test positive and are home for the five days and then back, who is monitoring that and making sure that the child then wears the mask? Or is it the child's responsibility? Probably depends on level. I would think at the element, elementary level, it's going to be uh, much more heavily monitored by the classroom teacher in conjunction with other teachers in the building and the school nurse. Yeah. Those buildings are smaller. Kids are more clustered together in their classrooms. Um, as they get older, it becomes a little more challenging, right? Yeah. So I, I would assume at the middle schools, they could, you know, keep their eye on them by cluster and that would, you know, that would be there. At the high school, it gets tricky because they're in, you know, seven or eight different classes with seven or eight different adults. Um, so it, it, it does get a little more challenging there. And, you know, we also need to be respectful. We don't want to send an email out to all those students and teachers to say so-and-so is coming back from COVID and needs to wear a mask. Um, so, you know, to be honest with you, the monitoring of it, particularly at the high school level, it's going yeah. to be challenging um, to, to do that for those five days. But I, I think, you know, between the administration and the nurses, they've been really good up here at finding ways to communicate appropriately with staff when a student is out with COVID um, or returning now. Um, because even though they're all wearing masks, they're, we're still trying to alert folks. Um, you know, so that we can make sure that if there's so close contacts, they can monitor their own okay. symptoms and all that. Um, so it's not the greatest answer to your question, but that's, yeah. I think it gets progressively more difficult as they get older. Um, and my second is like similar to that, but a little bit different. So if we're handing over the option to the parents to decide if they want their children to wear a mask or not, um, my concern is that I think at the elementary level, it would be a little bit more reasonable, but how are we going to 
make sure that the student is actually wearing that? Is that up to the student? Is that up to the staff? Because if it's up to parental control mm -hmm. and opinion, um, I just seeing that maybe getting teased a little bit more or taking it off, and if it's ultimately the parent's decision, that's been the number one thing that people have asked me about. Yeah, yeah I mean, I want to be, I want to be honest with parents. I mean, particularly if you have a high school aged child, I mean, there's only, we, we can only go so far before, you know, unless we're following that child around the building all, since say child, that young adult around building all day long. Um, but if, if a student is expected to wear a mask because it's a parental decision, that's not a health issue that we would not be able to communicate, right? So that's actually something that's easier that we could get a message out to staff members that this is who they should keep an eye on. Um, I do worry at the high school level that if the student really doesn't want to do it and they're being non-compliant even though parents at home are saying they have to wear it, I think that's where the associate principal would have to have a meeting with the parent and they'd have to kind of work that out uh, together because if uh, parent, guardian, mom and dad are saying you got to do this and student is saying absolutely not when they get there it puts the school in a really tough spot because what can they do they can't physically mask the, 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 the student when they're here yeah my concern was just more of like adding things to the teachers plates yeah, where yeah. they already have enough just to monitor you know who's coming back from covid who needs to have it on whose yeah. parent wants this um so i was just more so worried about it being another thing added to an already stressed out. Yeah, that's not, that's no question that that would be. And I think we'd have to take a, we're going to do the best we can with that approach, particularly at the secondary level. Again, I think it's a little easier, not that compliance is easy at the elementary level, but I think visually it's easier for a teacher to know who should be masked and who's not. Um, I, I wouldn't want to put such a burden on teachers that it's distracting from their work more so than it already is. We just ask them to partner with us and help as best they can to try and make this happen. My, my guess, too, is that if we go this direction, it's going to start at a certain percentage, and then over time, it's just going to trickle down um, as, as you know, parents are watching how numbers are folding and unfolding. And um, so the, 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 the issue may become less over time. Uh, it's just an uneducated guess, but um, that's what I think may happen over time. Uh, my other question was, this is th for K through 12, right? So the pre-K students, they would still be masked or no? No, I think it's all, I think it's all schools. It's all I, I'll double check that, but I don't, because, yeah, I think it's, I think it's everybody. Um, okay, and then you had to answer some of my other questions. So I, I guess my other concern was if we're expecting a spike after February vacation, are we going to have some sort of plan implemented for if we move, go forward with making them optional for students for after April vacation as well? Because I think we know that's coming as well, too, and there will be travel involved then. So are we going to hopefully put something in place for that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I'd be willing to bring that back for conversation before suggesting we make that part of the decision tonight only because I think February will tell us something we'll okay. see what happens there we'll continue to watch the numbers statewide and in the city and among students and staff in the school and if numbers keep going down and they're even lower than they are now and we don't have a spike after February we may not feel like it's necessary to do that but if the data tells us otherwise then I think we should be prepared to do that um, uh, I'm not opposed to the idea I just think Let's wait and see what, what it tells us. Yeah, okay. it tells us. All right, I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Okay, next on the list, Mr. Torello. Thank you, Dr. Regan, for putting that together for us. Um, I have a couple questions about people who are immune compromised. Um, do we have a rough idea of, of how many staff members and, and students we have that them themselves have a serious condition which may affect their immune system? It would be hard for me to answer that. Yeah, I don't have that information. So I've been thinking really hard about <clears throat> what this is, what this topic really means. Um, and the analogy that I came up with is peanut butter in our classrooms. Kids with allergies that have an al allergic reaction to peanut butter, we've all stopped using peanut butter and being able to send peanut butter to schools with our kids. I'd love to send my kids to school with, with peanut butter crackers, those little orange crackers. I love them as myself, <laughs> but we can't do that anymore because we have students who have allergies. 
So we've all given that up collectively to make sure that it's safe for everyone. At this time, we still have a lot of people who either aren't vaccinated, they can't get vaccinated, they may be pregnant, they may have younger children at home, they may um, be afraid of bringing stuff home to their grandparents or other family members. It's really hard to say that this is the time to, to take this off, especially with the CDC still recommending that we, we continue to mask, especially if you're in a high risk, if you're a high risk person or if there's a high risk person in your family. Um, my other concerns are what happens when we start removing the masks and it's now optional. We're gonna have teachers who may decide to wear it. Um, you know, I, I work in a school and I've already heard teachers talk about isolating different groups. So if you wanted to wear a mask, you can sit with people who want to wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, you're going to be sitting with people who don't want to wear a mask because no one's going to feel comfortable being with those people. What's going to happen when I, we have a teacher who's either decides to be wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and you have a student who is either wearing a mask or not wearing a mask and now they feel uncomfortable because that other person is is there in their space and they may be wearing a mask or not wearing a mask. Are we going to be entertaining the option of changing classes if the family is looking for the ability to see the teacher's face and the teacher still wants to be masked? Um, there's a whole bunch of different things that that kind of go into this. Um, and throughout this whole pandemic, it's been really troubling to me that we're all suffering, we're all going through this immense trauma. And instead of being able to come together and look out for one another, we've just found another way to other each other. I mean, it goes to why we had the books today. It's just more othering and more division among our society. We need to all come together to, to be for everyone, to make sure that everyone's feeling comfortable and everyone's supported. Um, going through this time. So right now I don't feel that removing the mask mandate is the best thing for us. Thank you. Okay, next on the list. Ms. Dolly, Ms. Sure. Maldibar, okay. Yeah. Sure, because um, I, I read those half a million emails <laughs> there, there we <laughs> go, <laughs> and have spoken to other people in other school systems and I see it with all the uh, items that you have in place as a, a good trial run, um, allowing those extra days after vacation. Um, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid of that. Anyone who is watching the statistics knows that the week after vacation. So to do it on, on March 7th would be better. And um, along with that, um, it's like a trial run and, and certainly with that idea that you have the authority to, uh, if things go askew, you have the authority to require masks again. And again, it's following the science, following the data that we have. So I would support it. Mrs. Aljamal. For two years, we have been asked to make decisions regarding masks, vaccines, um, all kinds of things that I never signed up for as a school committee member. Um, all along, we have been watching our trends mirror the trends in the community. So if the community is having a spike, we have a spike. If the community is trending downward, we are trending downward. Um, regardless of masks or no masks, because for a time we were requiring masks in our schools and the city did not require masks, yet we still mirrored what happened in the community. I think it is time for us to get back to focusing on teaching and learning and not having discussions about masks and vaccines. I think we need to turn that over to our Board of Health 
They have doctors on their board who are responsible to make decisions for our entire community, including our schools. If the Board of Health states that at 2% we require masks, then in our schools at 2% we should be requiring masks. If this Board of Health says at 2%, if we are below 2%, we do not need masks, then I believe in our schools we do not need masks. I think picking a March 7th date is kind of arbitrary. We're guessing that the data is going to change. We don't know that the data is going to change. I think people travel and behave differently during February vacation than they do over the holiday break. Um, I am not convinced that we're going to see a spike like we did over the holidays. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that we should rescind the policy effective February 28th and go by what the city is enacting at the time. If the city is still over 2% and is requiring masks indoors, then we continue in the schools. If it has been lifted citywide, <coughs> then I think we do that in the schools as well. And I would fully give you the authority to reinstate them based on recommendations by the Board of Health and also the state as you're requesting. But I'm thinking that that March 7th date is pretty much arbitrary. I mean, we could say, no, we really need to give it two weeks to see if there's a spike. One week isn't enough. We don't know. So let's just go by the data. And if the data says it's below 2%, then that's when we lift. Mm -hmm. Mr. Prasco. So all of you up on this stage, know for the past three months I've been dealing with a relative who had major open heart surgery and for three months we've worn these masks because his immune system is real low we go over we visit make sure he's okay he wears his I wear mine I take him to his doctor's appointments same thing but what I feel uncomfortable about is, if I say to you, now I need you to wear your mask for me so I can keep him safe. I appreciate that. But wait, I'm gonna ask now the people that live with you to wear their masks so you stay safe, so then I stay safe to keep him safe. Mm -hmm. Now I'm stretching that. Now let's ask the people that they work with at your house to put their masks on, to keep them safe, to keep you safe. Seven, seven steps to Kevin Bacon there. So what I'm trying to say is, I agree. And again, someone said earlier, these aren't doing anything. Up here, to me, I'm keeping him healthy. So I'm gonna keep this on, probably for about another month, because he's getting better. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'll do, I'll keep it on. Make sure he's okay. But I don't know if I feel the right to say to somebody else, you have to keep yours on to keep me safe, to keep him safe. So I think I will agree as well that we should give an option. And I'm not saying everybody take them off. I'm saying give the option, as has been said. Someone wants to wear a mask, let them wear a mask. Someone doesn't, don't. The only thing I request is, please let's just get respectful for that. Let's show some respect. My gosh, if I have this on, don't laugh at me for it. If you leave yours on, I won't care. But if I have mine off, that same respect. We've lost that somewhere. It's driving me insane for the last two weeks. I just, it gets me more upset. So again, I say we go a decision up to the parent to make that decision, whether they wear it or not, remind our kids Let's not pick on anybody because they have it on or not. And I know how this works because I've done it for a few years. Sometimes you got to bend a little. So I'll bend a little bit for the March 7th, but I agree with Mrs. Al-Jamal. What happens if it doesn't have, have, if we don't have a problem? Now we just want an extra week to keep it. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll 
agree to the March 7th, also giving you that if there is an issue that things go up in the city, the reinstatement issue, yes. But I just think we have to let people make their decisions right now. And again, don't laugh at me because I'll have this on for another month at these meetings. But <laughs> again, I think that's what we need to do to get everybody feeling like they can make their decision. Thanks for your time. This is Gailey. Um, well, I do understand what Ms. Ajmal is saying, but I also know having lived the February vacation time that it is a really um, busy time where a lot of families do try to do vacation because we're done with the cold winter, we want to get away, we want to go someplace where it's warm, and so there are many, many, many families traveling over that vacation. So I, I, I support Dr. Regan's uh, decision to go and hold off till March 7, just to see what happens. I mean, it's not going to hurt. We're going to find out if, if everything's great, and then, then that's fine. And I also feel very strongly that parents need to have the right to make decisions about their kids, whether they're going to wear masks or not. I think that's the right thing to do at this point. I mean, we've had enough experience with masking and telling people they have to wear masks, not wear masks now. They said now we don't have to. So I think we need to give parents some say over what they want to do. If they feel, you know, for maybe it's a reason the child needs to wear the mask or maybe it's just, you know, something they want to do. Um, and in terms of the teachers, I think that, um, you know, it'll be a bit of a challenge in the beginning for the teachers to figure out who's wearing what and why they're wearing it and do they have to and do that. But I've also heard from teachers who have asked that they, they don't feel comfortable wearing masks either. So we have to kind of play it out and see what happens and try to adjust as we move forward. But uh, I really feel strongly about the fact that parents need to have some say in this, whether or not there's going to be masks or not. Thank you, Mrs. Gately. Mayor McCarthy. Okay, full disclosure here. I received a communication at 3.23 this afternoon regarding the positivity rate for Waltham from Michelle Feely, Director of Health. Want to let you know that our positivity rate is now at 1.63%. The dashboard does not come out until tomorrow, early evening. I have notified the board of members board members of the new rate. And I believe what they had voted was if it goes below 2% or above 2%, it, it's reversed. So, um, so that's what the issue is about the Board of Health, uh, you know, uh, rate that they keep. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion? I move we follow the recommendation. Um, of the superintendent and uh, we'll drop the requirement as of the seventh I mean the uh, is it the seventh now we're talking about <laughs> yes this the seventh and give him the, the authority which, which excuse me which allows a one week after vacation yes. and um, historically as we said after every vacation, after two or three days, it dropped back to, to normal, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well. And that, that um, if, in fact, things change, the data changes, um, then he has the right to do that. He has the authority to change it. And, and I think that's the only thing. We cannot predict it, and we cannot, but at that point, then, the parents will have a choice for the seventh. I'll second Ms. Donnelly's motion. So there's two issues within that one motion, correct? Yes. That you, March 7th, plus give the superintendent the authority to do what? Said You said change it? Rescind the mask. In, is the 7th day, it's a Sunday or a Friday? Monday. Monday. Monday, okay. Okay. So I thought you were words. talking about that he could t put it back on. So could you make that, clarify that, please, for us, Mr. Donnelly? Okay, so give uh, us the first motion. 
the recommendation by the superintendent that we wait until the 7th to rescind the mass date and again I, I like to qualify that by saying because the numbers always go up right after the vacation uh, and um, after that he has the authority parents have the choice after that and he has the authority to reinstate it if in fact certain science shows that we should okay that's a uh, respectful i like to have that as a second motion because it's not uh, you know okay so we'll, do, we'll go on the first one uh, march 7th march 7th with the understanding that that is vocation i have i have that as part of the record mm -hmm. is there a second for that second this is gately seconded okay any questions discussion on this motion Hearing none, roll call. Mr. Terrell. Yes. Mrs. Gately. Yes. Mrs. Al Jamal. No. Ms. Donnelly. Yes. Ms. Coleman. Yes. Mr. Frasca. Yes. Okay. Five in favor, one opposed. Now, Ms. Donnelly, you still have the floor. And what, once the um, March 7th comes um, and is rescinded then the parents still have the choice that doesn't have to be part of it but we know that um, and uh, if the science changes and the numbers tick up that he can reinstate the mandate uh, just for clarification I was asking to align my decision with the Board of Health so it was if the city reinstates then I would I, th so I think their language the said that if it goes down, it's rescinded, but oh, they don't have I'm, I'm pretty sure they took care of that, but I will check on that tomorrow. But okay. And I have a, a side question on that. Uh, sure. I, see, I see the Board of Health's, um, w what they oversee is quite different from us. We've got uh, over 5,500 yeah. kids in buildings for together yeah. and on buses and um, the oh, Board of Health board takes health. care of restaurants and things like that so I don't really like the comparison of the two okay I understand that the only from the chair I'm gonna say if the states is gone Desi is gone and the health is gone I question what authority you have to do it you know what I mean? In other words, our policy, you're saying it's our policy? It, our policy is still in place, right? And the state Department of Ed said they would recognize that if this local school committee kept the policy in place. Yeah. Um, I, I was trying to think of if, we, if, it needed, if they need to be put back on, I don't want it to be arbitrary. I wanted to base it on something, and I was thinking of the local Board of Health as okay. sort of the lead local agency to guide our decision on that. If the state, you know, if the state implements it, that's a different story. We'll move in that direction. But. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. I'm going to check the website while you're doing it. Go ahead. Just one minute, please. I just want to check the website to see if it, it's on there. faster than I will I, don't see it, but I might be missing it I don't see it it's under the wall Tim yeah board of health let's look under board of health last item I see is January 19th okay but I think that the order itself was what they had I was just looking for that sorry I didn't bring it was there a second 
Yeah, what, what, one missed, John. I'm just checking something to okay, see if there's yeah. something on the Board of Health's website. When there's a pause, I wonder. Yeah, <laughs> there was a pause for that. <laughs> see it, John. I don't see it. I don't see it, yep. I'm just going to look under COVID for a minute. Apologize. I'm almost done. Here we go. Twelve thirty twenty one. Oh, to implement an indoor mask policy. Yeah, you have to you have to click on it. Right there. Right there. Positive two percent. Does it say it? For the third year. Nine twenty two, one eight twenty two. Yep. The copy of this mandate. You have to just press the attachment right there. Okay, here it says. If I could read it. The, and I know a motion's in, but there's a question on that. Not the second motion yet. We voted the first one. The second motion was. Yeah. Um, okay, if you got that. Okay. Not yet, John. It's not moving up. I'm sorry. Okay. Right on the end here. Yeah, so mine doesn't have that Yeah, on. okay, yeah, right here. So, the, end. the mandate will be in effect when the positivity rate in Waltham is at 2% over a consecutive two week period. This mandate will stay in effect till the next Board of Health meeting. So that's what they're saying. week period that's until the next board of health meeting so I'm not sure where the, the next one is yeah okay let's entertain the other motion Mr. Arnley go ahead so we all set the next motion okay you made a motion yes that um, when March 7th occurs that um, we rescind the mask mandate for the uh, Waltham Public Schools buildings and um, give the authority to the superintendent to reinstate it if the numbers change. Okay, is there a second on that one? Second. Second, Mrs. Gately. Discussion? Mrs. Aljamal. I think we need clarification on when the numbers change. Yeah. We can't so, just yeah, leave it at say an that, arbitrary but point, but actually have something that we can definitively, definitively yeah. look at to make a decision. So the there request the of the superintendent that, was to tie it with the Waltham Board of Health number and their actions. That's what he said, right? That's correct. 
Mr. Ali, do you take that as a friendly amendment or not? I do. I do. Do you take that as a friendly amendment? His request I do. was, to, uh, she, she, okay, to tie it to the Board of Health numbers. So Ms. Darnley takes that as a friendly amendment. Now, any other questions? Ms. Make another friendly amendment and also give him the authority to reinstate if Desi enacts a statewide school mask mandate. Do you view that friendly, Ms. Darnley? If Desi what? If Desi enacts a statewide school mandate. Okay, yes. She views that friendly. So the, let's vote on the two amendments first. All in favor of the two amendments as stated, the um, Walt M. Board of Health um, mm -hmm. mandate and number and the DESI mandate. So do them one at a time. One at a time, okay. We'll do the first one then. Walt M. Board of Health to tie the superintendent's authority to the Walt M. Board of Health number. Higher than two percent, I mean mandate, excuse me. Mandate. This is Gately, you got a second? Okay, all those in One favor second. of that? Yes. Aye. Second. Aye. Aye. Okay, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. I have to have a motion for us, sorry. All those in favor of that friendly amendment, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay. Now the second one, Ms. Donnelly, you want to say is to tie it to Desi's mandate, right? Yes. In other words, the superintendent's authority is tied to the Desi's mandate, correct? Correct. After March 7th. All right. Now, is that your motion? Right, Ms. Donnelly, is that your motion? Yes. Okay. Is there a second? Second. 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 All right, double seconds over there. Okay, all those in favor of the second amendment? Aye. 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 Now the main motion as amended, as amended, is before you. Any questions on that? I can tell you what it is. We got it, we got it. Just tying it to the two people. Okay, so there's a motion. Is there a second on the double amended motion? Second. 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 What was my motion? <laughs> Don't worry, Margie, I got you. Toralo. <laughs> okay, any questions on that? All those in favor? Oh, I should uh, have a roll call on this one. Mr. Toralo. Yes. Mrs. Gately. Yes. Mrs. Aljamal. Yes. Ms. Donnelly. Yes. Mrs. Coleman. Yes. Mr. Fresco. Yes. Okay. Any other items you wish to address on this matter? Yes. Yes, Ms. Donnelly, you want another one? Uh, not a motion, but um, if, uh, and I'm sure um, Dr. Regan will take care of that to uh, allow parents to have the children wear their masks if they want to. And it doesn't need to be enforced by right. the so staff. There'll be a communication know. we'll go out tomorrow. Voluntary mm -hmm. choice. A lot of people mention that in their emails. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that, yes, Ms. Mrs. Aljamal. I just want to add, just for clarification to anyone who's watching, that the buses will still require masks, mm. um, and that comes from the federal level, not from the state or from ours, our decision. So on the school buses, masks will still be required. And nurses' offices, right. Yeah. So we'll have masks at the entrance of nurses' offices so kids can don them if they don't have them. So the State Department of Education issued an advisory yesterday basically saying what they feel is still a mandate. So you might want to look at that. Okay. One included transportation, others include hospitals. You know what I mean? So it's not just transportation. Okay? Now. You don't need a motion on that, right, Ms. Donnelly? You're just saying it. Right. That we don't okay. need a motion on that. All right. The superintendent's going to send out a communication regarding parents and what their options are. Right? Okay, now, here we go. 
Next item, superintendent's update, miscellaneous personnel and yes. information. I'll be very quick here. Uh, you have additional personnel items in your packet. I wanted to let you know that uh, Ms. Landry's former position has been posted as of this week. <clears throat> I'll keep you posted on that. I know there are a few members that have asked to be participants. We'll make sure you are. Just wanted to announce that Dance Theater is back after a hiatus due to COVID. I was down during the 3.30 performance today. Really awesome. They're performing again tomorrow night and then again Friday night. It's exciting to see these things coming back online. I was able to go to the freshman honor roll breakfast this morning. I think mm. there were close to 180 ninth graders in attendance uh, having breakfast and uh, associate principal Lyons made a few remarks, gave out certificates. It was really a positive uh, event to celebrate uh, the hard work of those freshmen in the class. Uh, and then there's just a photo on my slide of a young man at the MacArthur School. I had a great visit there on Monday and that given the length of the meeting is my very quick superintendent's update. Okay. Now we have unfinished business. MSBA, Mr. Fresca. Thank you, Mayor. School Building Committee met this past Monday, February 14th at 5.30 p.m. Discussions were held regarding the installment of rebar, forms, walls, steel being placed in, in place on Building A, underground electrical and plumbing being worked on, and exporting of rock and soil from the site. The construction project is still on schedule as of Monday night. Coordination, shop drawings, and material procurement are also on schedule. A second crane is being brought in to start the work on buildings A, C, and D, while the current crane is being moved on the opposite side of the site to start on building B and E. We were informed that the total hours work to date on this project has been 108,000 work hours in the last two months, averaging 50 workers on site daily. Also on Monday, February 14th, members of our Waltham City Council were allowed to take a tour of the new high school site with the mayor. Our next meeting is set for Monday, March 14th at 5.30 p.m. More information will be and has always been shared on the School Building Committee website. Just go to the district's website, look for the big red box, and on the right-hand side, you'll find a link that says the Waltham High School Building Project. It's updated constantly for the public's viewing. That's my report. Okay. Anybody else? Anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, just really quickly, as you know, it is Black History Month. I just wanted to point out our student newspaper, the uh, Talon Tribune. Uh, this Justin Carrington put a really cool article out there uh, called Happy Black History Month. Here's some people making an impact on black history right now. It's an interesting article that sort of goes beyond the historical figures that we often talk about during Black History Month and talks about folks living right now that are doing a variety of things in the community to have an impact. So I just thought that was a really uh, interesting and well done article. And I uh, also wanted to note that the Kennedy Middle School staff has recently uh, partnered with the Safe Schools program for LGBTQ students. It's a state program uh, and they had a collaborative meeting with them at their during their building meeting on 2-7. So uh, just two items to, to bring to your attention. Uh, in the dual language school, there is a presentation scheduled for March 16th to give you an update on, on that program's expansion. And yes, so I may have jumped to the next item there by mistake, Mayor, but. Sorry about that. So uh, the dual language school is March 16th. Utilization of the high school. I don't have anything formal that's tonight. Ne for that. That's ne next time, I guess. And then uh, Edco update. Yeah, this is just informational. It's in your packet. You know, there's an ongoing issue with Edco closing. I just wanted you to be aware of where we're at with the lease closure, which is the biggest uh, liability for member districts right now. The lease is at two point one million dollars to close. Waltham's estimated share is ninety nine thousand eight hundred and ninety seven dollars. Uh, we're not being asked to pay that now, but my I suspect that we will be asked to pay that before the close of the fiscal year. Um, but it's a moving target, but I didn't want you to be out of the loop. So it was just informational tonight. Okay, discussion of the 
policies governing public participation. I think this was listed in the agenda as my item, Mayor, but that was a mistake. I apologize. You and I yeah. talked about this. That's right. And you asked me to add it, so I did include both of the public speak policies that are in the policy book. Okay. Anybody like to talk about it first? Seeing none, Mr. Roscoe. Thank you, Mayor McCarthy. Could I take my mask down? Nobody's around me. By way of, pub of background information, I am one of the co-authors of the Community Speaks Forum, which was enacted during my initial term on the school committee from 1986 to 1991. School committee member Robert McGovern and I formulated a policy that the school committee adopted which allowed residents of Waltham to address the school committee for five minutes in the first 15 minutes of each regular meeting on any school-related topic. It was not limited to items on the agenda. It was limited to Waltham residents, and no specific collective bargaining items could be addressed by the speakers. It was a novel idea. <clears throat> And God rest his soul, Mr. Mr. McGovern has passed away. I apologize because I did not instantly realize that Community Speaks had changed to limit participation to agenda items. Now to the current policies. School Committee Policy BEDH indicates that discussion for Waltham citizens is limited to those items on the school committee agenda for that evening. However, among other things, school committee policy BEDH-E allows Waltham citizens to address topics on the agenda, items specified for public comment, or items within the scope of the responsibility of the school committee. These two policies are substantially different. The conflict between the two policies is problematic and needs to be fixed. When there is inconsistency or conflict between two policies, it is generally enforced against the drafter, in this case, the Waltham School Committee. If Waltham citizens follow the policy, the citizen should be allowed to speak. I have long had a problem with this policy manual because it's not user-friendly, but now I know it's not consistent either. This year, when the policy manual was adopted, I insisted that the school committee's policy subcommittee reconvene to make it user-friendly. Now it will have to make it consistent as well. All Waltham residents should be able to speak at the Community Speaks Forum envisioned more than 30 years ago. So I apologize, Mr. Chair, because I came in five minutes late for the meeting and I was trying to assist, as you were, but I clearly know what Community Speaks was. Now, I went back to the uh, 2004 manual. I went back to the 2016 manual, and those were the issues about Community Speaks. Now, personally, I feel that we should go back to the old one because th when this was done, there was no opportunity for parents. They were meeting in people's houses, people's basements, you know, they did, and contacting school committee members to come over there to share with them because they, they couldn't communicate. Now, I will say this, 
I feel it's important. We may not like the length of it, and tonight I appreciate everybody giving everyone the opportunity, and we've done that in the past when items were necessary. But I don't really feel that a parent, and I, regardless of who it is, should have to say, whoop, it's not on the agenda, or you have to put it on the agenda. See, that second policy says you can request to put it on. Well, what if it doesn't go on? So as long as the speech is about items related to the school system, and we don't have the ability to respond under this policy, and parents need to know that, we can't engage in a dialogue, I feel it provides the necessary outlet for any Waltham citizen to be able to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Brusk. Thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate the apology, but not necessary. Thank you. Mr. Tarallo, you have a comment. Um, Paul, it's not a policy, but exhibit B E D H E is an exhibit and not a policy in our policy book. So at the beginning of our policy book, it explains what um, the symbols and signs are in our policy book. And it says the E stands for exhibit. The symbols following a code indicate it that the statement is reference documents such as a calendar, appendant, uh, application form, etc., rather than a policy. So that's the difference between the two different sections of our policy book. Could I have that? Are you looking for an answer on that? Oh, Actually, I'm, yes. I'm explaining. A... Thank you, Mr. Tarallo. Uh, Mayor McCarthy. First of all, that's what was handed out. That was requested by me, er, to me, excuse me, early this year to hand that out. And I said, no, I'm not handing that out. So I really feel that it says here, file, B-E-D-H, okay? Approved, August 31st, 2016. And then it says file, B-E-D-H. Those are the actual ones that were provided. So that's to indicate, but, but with all due respect, oh. to indicate, that's what the problem with this policy manual is. I shouldn't have to be a Philadelphia lawyer to understand it, <laughs> and no one should have to go through this to understand it. The captions are terrible, but it's, t it's titled, Public Participation at School Committee Meetings. And the next one is Guidelines for Public Comment. So... Those guidelines for public comment, no matter how you get around it, you read them together. You can't. So one is the rule, the other one is the guidelines. So when you read them together, they're not consistent. So that's why I apologize to the public. I feel it's necessary. I'm the chair, and quite frankly, I ask for the book to be here from now on so that easily I can look it up. But Mr. Fresco was doing the best he could with what he was given. People pointed out afterwards, the superintendent sent it to us, saying, well, and Mrs. Landry found it, looking, this one's there too. So that's all I'm gonna say. The titles of them are guidelines for public comment. This one says, public participation at school, school committee meetings. So, there's all kinds of other things in there. That's why I said in my, my statement, among other things, it, it has in there. Okay? So, I, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, those are in there. And if you want me to go look at the index for every single time I have to look up something, What's it in? What's it not? That's the problem with our manual. This afternoon, I took the manual, I told you, from 2004 and another one from 2016, I think. It was this big. Our manual right now is like this big. So it's supposed to be a usable document. So I, I don't know what else to say. Thank you, Mr. Fresco. Thank you. Mayor, any other discussion? Okay. 
So I'd like oh, to make a motion. Sorry, this is okay. yeah. If there's no one, oh, so I apologize. Bust. That's okay. Okay, so through the chair to Mr. Tarallo, I'm just looking for clarification. The exhibit is just a guideline for us to follow, and then the policy no. is actually what we have said we will follow. Is that correct? Correct. I think the intention of the exhibit is to help for if let's say we're discussing a matter such as traffic on South Street, you know, in relation to Stanley School, someone may want to come in and start talking about Brandeis and how they cause all the traffic. That's nothing that we can out of our jurisdiction. So to help hone that their comment, it's also included that anything that's in our jurisdiction can be spoken about so that we kind of hone in what we're what we're discussing and i think the intention of the it needs to be on the agenda is so that both sides have the opportunity to to speak to issues that are on our agenda because we're looking for the input about what we're speaking about that night we have lots of opportunities for people to add things to our agenda but having um, open night mic at the apollo is not what we're we're <laughs> intending for so that's kind of what the, the difference is. I understand the policy as it's written. And I'm looking at this and it was approved August 31st of 2016. That is prior to the time that I was appointed to this committee. Since being on <clears throat> this committee, I don't recall ever, ever adhering to that policy. We have always allowed any citizen of Waltham to come before us during public input and to speak to us regarding any matters that have to do with our schools. Um, that being said, I'm not comfortable with this policy as it stands. And I would request that the subcommittee meet to review the policy and perhaps make some amendments. Any that other discussion? Policy. I know the mayor was about to make a motion though. So. I'm done. I'm sorry? I don't have the form. There's a motion on the form, Mr. This is just a request though. I don't hear a motion. No, I didn't motion? make a motion. I no, she didn't make a motion. Okay. So. A request? It was just a request. Okay. I can make it a motion. I make a motion that the policy subcommittee meet mm -hmm. to review mm -hmm. the policy entitled public participation at school committee meetings to see if an amendment to the policy is in order. Second. Any other discussion? I agree with Mrs. Thank Mr. you. Russell? I agree with Mrs. Al Jamal that we've never not done that before, and I said it out loud that night twice, I believe. But you know, if I had run for office the last two times because this was fun, sometimes <laughs> you don't like to hear certain things. But when they stand over there and talk. Sometimes, even though you don't want to hear it, it makes you sit back, and I've said this before, it makes you sit back and say, am I not thinking straight here? Am I not paying attention right? So I'm going to vote yes on this, because I, I, I and, and I'm on that committee, and I'll be happy to step back into that room and figure out what we need to do. So I just wanted to say that before we had any votes. So. You want me to get, you want to? Well, I, I would like to have the floor after the vote. Okay. So, you've heard the motion. Roll call, Mr. Tarallo. Yes. Mrs. Gately. Yes. Mrs. Aljamal. Yes. Ms. Donnelly. Yes. Mrs. Coleman. Yes. Mayor McCarthy. Yes. And the chair will say yes as well. Mayor McCarthy, you have the floor. Okay. So now I would like to point out file BEDH-E. I make a motion that that go 
to the policy committee to determine if that language, whatever you're going to call it, is consistent with the language that that exists for public participation at school committee meetings or the language that might come as a result of changes to that. I don't believe that you can take these two pages and not address them because this was approved by the school committee on August 31st, 2016. Same day as the other one. Heard the motion. And, I, and, and I, I assume that came out of a policy committee because we usually adopt it in January. Okay? So that's my motion. Thank you. Second. Seconded by Mr. Tarallo. Any discussion? Roll call, Mr. Tarallo. Yes. Mrs. Gately. Yes. Mrs. Al Jamal. Yes. Ms. Donnelly. Yes. Mrs. Coleman. Yes. Mayor McCarthy. Yes. And the chair will say yes. Okay, thank you very much. All right, now. Next item is preliminary budget presentation, FY23. This will actually be brief, even though it seems like a big topic, but as you know, you just got your books tonight. The intention of the way this is going to uh, be rolled out is to give you the book. I'll give you a sort of 30,000 foot uh, context overview, and then the committee has two weeks to, before the next meeting to look at the book, and uh, what I'd ask you to do is share any questions that you have, if you can, individually through an email to me ahead of time, wouldn't email the whole committee, just email me, uh, so that Ms. Wilsinski and I can work to get those questions answered at the public meeting on um, uh, March 2nd. Um, you know, because the budget is so complex, uh, we'll be happy to take your questions without preparation on the 2nd as well, but any that you can get to us ahead of time uh, would really help us to uh, be efficient when we do the formal presentation. So. Uh, <coughs> We had an initial uh, budget process that brought us in at about an 11% increase, or FY22, included about 80 positions. Um, we did a lot of work over the past couple of months to get us where we are currently, which is at a 7.33 increase, uh, and about 33.5 new FTE, 18 of those coming from the general fund and 22 from grant funds. Um, just some context around that number because it is high, I realize that, uh, but the committee should be aware that when we look at our level services, that is applying everything we're doing this year to next year, it requires about a 6.6% increase to do just the same thing next year as we are this year. So those new requests that you see um, on this slide really amount to less than 1% of the overall increase and that's you know related to a couple of factors we had a significant increase in costs um, relative to out of district uh, placement our circuit breaker started this year at zero so we weren't able to uh, up, you know carry any of that over from the previous year so um, we didn't have those funds uh, we have collective bargaining contingencies you know that we are bargaining with seven units this year uh, so there are some contingencies in there, some unknowns. We had increases to transportation as a part of our multi-year contract with Eastern Bus. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I think the other thing you'll note that when I quickly go through an overview of the request, you'll see that most, the majority of them fall under sort of that category of student services. It's not that we're looking to increase our teaching core. We're well staffed there. It's the other stuff that is impacting students right now as a result, no doubt, as uh, from the pandemic. I also think that's a driver around the out-of-district increases. We're seeing students that are much more dysregulated than normal, uh, and we're unable to sort of serve them in district as we uh, have been able to do for so uh, many other students. So 
Um, these are just factors that are there. Uh, the inflation number, as you know, is right in the six to six and a half range. So when I say that level services budget hits at about six and a half, it's not surprising that uh, we're sort of right in line um, with that. So that's just, again, some of the context to that, that percentage. Um, so last year, and if you look at the very top 001 general fund, I know it's small up there, I'm sorry, uh, but this is in your budget book. Um, you know, last year's budget was at 94 million, just over 94 million. Uh, this year's current request, as you have it in front of you, is at 100 million, 978,135. That's general fund requests. If you include state grants, private grants, federal funds, our food service funds, all in total, uh, where we stand now, it comes in at $107,268,895. Um, so just uh, quickly, just so you have a sense, um, and you can see here as I go through some of the new positions that are in the initial request to you to consider, uh, a paraprofessional for health services that is bilingual. We are finding our health offices need this support. This would be district-wide. Uh, this is a para position, but it would be a CNA. Uh, an evaluation team leader increase at dual language. As that school continues to grow, we need additional support there. Uh, paraprofessionals at the high school, some of these would be inclusion, some of them would be one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this is, again, to make sure that our programming at the high school is compliant with student IEPs. Uh, speech language support split between Kennedy and McDevitt. A special education uh, increase at dual language of 0.4. Uh, and a special education teacher at the high school in the connections program. Again, you can see where the category is that all of these positions fall under. Uh, a bilingual counselor to be split between McDevitt and Kennedy to support our, um, our multilingual students. School adjustment counselor increase at dual language up to 1.0. It's an increase of 0.2 FTE. Um, and, and also an increase uh, of a school adjustment counselor at Stanley in the task program. It's an increase of 0.4. Uh, a director of guidance position that we're looking to um, split the function that is currently in the position that Katie Willard holds. She needs to spend 100% of her time on social emotional learning activities in the district K-12. She does not have the capacity to oversee functions of secondary guidance building the master schedule, uh, overseeing uh, standardized testing, uh, implementing a curriculum that is more proactive than reactive for our guidance counselors that they're pushing into classes uh, using a state approved curriculum. These are major functions of guidance um, that as much as she tries, her focus right now is really around SEL. So um, we're, we're looking to um, expand the leadership among SEL and guidance. Uh, a world language teacher, uh, this is to kind of go with what we were talking about earlier around the middle school schedule. Um, if you think about it, we would get what we are, what they described earlier, pushing the world language down to sixth grade by just adding a .6 total. Um, that's a really good deal. Uh, if you think about it, what we're getting for less than one teacher. Um, MIS technician, we have not increased that staff in a number of years, although we've increased the devices uh, threefold, I think, uh, or more. Um, so we have all of these one-to-one -one devices and we have not increased our technicians and they are really stretched. They actually could use two. Uh, one is surviving in the budget at this point. Uh, we have some program expansion going on as usual. DL continues to grow. Our recommendation is to provide curriculum support and support to students in the form of an assistant principal at dual language. Now that it's gonna be in two locations, Yes, Mr. Gilday, uh, Mr. Sweeter, and Ms. Norris are at Kennedy, but there really needs to be somebody that is able to support the students from the DL uh, angle there, particularly uh, around the instructional element. Um, and this person also would spend some time uh, at the um, location of 510 Moody Street as well, supporting the principal there. Uh, the next two are teachers that we would add to grade six to accommodate the sixth grade dual language students there, history or science. Uh, we would look for one of those specialties to be, uh, sorry, one of those subject areas to be taught by a bilingual teacher. Um, we're just leaving it open because we want to see what kinds of candidates might be out there. Uh, and then a Spanish language arts. That's a, a, a really a hallmark of the sixth grade dual language program. Kids would have a Spanish language arts class in their schedule. 
Um, by bringing the sixth graders over to Kennedy, there would be a shift, of, of an ad rather, of some uh, fine arts and uh, practical arts at KMS. That's the point three two. Uh, and then we continue to look ahead at CTE prepping for the move to um, across the street. So we need some uh, additional staffing to expand our collision tech program and our culinary arts program, and those are both uh, 0.6 ads. We are closing the welding sh uh, shop, but that position is needed in health assisting, so it's an even swap. So that 1.0 that's retiring, uh, will go over to health assisting and help us there because we have growing numbers, which is awesome, uh, but we need additional staff there. Uh, we also have some new funded positions that will fall fully under the under uh, grants. Uh, someone that will help us coordinate project-based learning. That is a, uh, a cornerstone of the new high school program. It is in the educational plan, and this person would uh, be sort of the point person on that, working with our assistant superintendent uh, for teaching and learning and our directors. I see this position as a fadeaway position. That's why it's perfect under a grant, because they would come in over a series of two plus years work with the district, get us ready to move over to that other building, and then we would be sort of train the trainer model, if you will, uh, will be where we need to be around project-based learning. Um, I've talked to folks before about the fact that we have a K through 12 math director. It is an impossible job, and it is a critically important subject area. So under ESSER funds, we would look to uh, add a director of STEM at the K-5, so we have a similar model in math as we do with literacy, where we have a K-5 director looking at our, eight, our uh, seven elementaries, and we have a six through 12 director looking at the two middles in the high school. This person would also take over the science, the responsibility of the science program at the elementary school, which now falls under the assistant superintendent. Um, it would be more appropriate there, and then can also help us with any expansion that we might have down the road with respect to engineering uh, or technology that falls outside the realm of what the digital learning teachers do. Um, we have been increasing math interventionists at the elementary school. Every school wants one. We don't have the funds for that. We based the new request at Stanley because of data. We looked at math performance at our elementaries that don't have interventionists, and Stanley right now is the school that needs uh, students need the most support. Um, so we would target Stanley for the next uh, math interventionist ad. Um, and then the last is uh, under Title I. Waltham High will become a Title I school next year for the, I don't know if it's the first time, but if it isn't the first time, it's the first time in a long time. Um, and we have extra funds from Title I that will apply to this building. Uh, this supervisor of academic support and tiered interventions, it's a long name. It may, it may evolve into a different name. Um, this is somebody that we would see as sort of Overseeing our efforts that we have right now around students that are at high risk of dropout, we've talked about this numerous times. We have a number of people doing good work around students that need this kind of support. We don't have anybody coordinating that effort, right? We don't have anybody that's sort of overseeing the work of our dropout prevention coordinators, of our attendance officers, of our people that are trying to re-engage with families. This person would be uh, the point person to help pull all of that work together so that we have one well-articulated set of expectations and goals to support kids that fall into that category of need. Uh, we have a few items that we eliminated. I think these come out to about 179,000. Uh, we have an unfilled library paraprofessional position um, at our elementaries. It's listed as district that we just did not need this year, so it doesn't seem necessary to keep in the budget. Um, we've had a stipend for a lead elementary math coach that would no longer need to be there if we picked up the K-5 uh, STEM director. Uh, the next two master schedule and testing coordinators, uh, those are paid to a high school person, unfortunately a different person almost every year. Um, if the guidance position were to survive, these two um, stipends could come out. Um, we've talked a lot uh, in, in this committee about sort of frustrations with the efficiency of the high school master schedule. A big component of that is I don't have somebody that has been built, that builds capacity that can, you know, develop that schedule year after year after year. It's sort of hot potato and the next person takes it and the next person takes it and there's just, it, it, it creates an inefficient schedule year after year after year. That's one of the bigger drivers around why I think the guidance director position is important these $20,000 in stipends would be removed because those responsibilities would fall under the guidance um, administrator. 
Um, we have a retirement around conflict resolution. Um, <coughs> that position is actually kind of tied to that Title I position, so we would remove the $94,000 salary of that individual in that new position I just described to you on the previous slide would pick up some of this work. Um, so there's sort of a whole reorg around that. Um, but the money comes out of the general fund because now we're gonna use Title I funds to cover that. Um, and then we have had a teacher serve as a PBL coordinator. Um, and if we have that um, coordinator of PBL that I mentioned in a previous slide, then this stipend uh, would go away. So um, that's a lot <laughs> for you folks to consider in, in one, uh, one five minute uh, information dump. But <laughs> the idea here was just to sort of put it out there, let you now dig into the book. Um, the data is in there presented in multiple ways. It's a lot. Um, if you've got questions, Leanne and I would be happy to either answer them via email or if you, you know, want to talk to us, we'd be happy to have a conversation with you as well. Um, next steps uh, tonight is I'm presenting it to you for you to review March 2nd um, we would have a budget discussion on the agenda where I'd be prepared to answer your questions a little more in depth and then the 16th we would schedule the public hearing um, you could vote the budget that night it's your choice um, but if not then we would look to April 6th to have a school committee vote um, on the budget to keep us on um, on schedule to get the budget into the mayor's office so that it can go before the city council as well. So that I realize that's a lot. Um, I'll give you copies of these slides too. Um, tomorrow we'll post them. Um, but the initial plan tonight was just to give you a little taste of this and then let you dig in and ask your questions at the next meeting. I want to thank Leanne. I want to thank her team, particularly Caitlin Wood, uh, who just worked so hard to put this together and. Um, it's 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 been a, a it really took a village to put this thing uh, in the position that it's in and i appreciate the whole team's efforts around this so that's the preliminary budget presentation <laughs> i almost did it Question. before 11. any questions on this okay Roscoe. Okay. New business. Library materials review committee's recommendation. Dr. Regan. So I, in your packet, I included a memo from me that uh, sort of summarizes uh, what the work of the library materials review committee was. You see the two recommendations from the committee. And I want to thank the members, Reba Tierney, librarian at the high school, Jeanette Gary, science teacher, Brenda Pena, principal, Heather Medalides, director of physical education, health and wellness, uh, Elizabeth Lear, parent, who's still here with us tonight, and Sarah Kent, our assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. Um, and I also included with you just the protocols that we uh, followed, just so you had all that in front of you as well. You heard, obviously, from several members of the public tonight uh, speaking on this issue. Um, just quickly, um, what they are proposing that I do support uh, is that the book Gender Queer remain in the library and that they make the following adjustments, that they move the barcode on the cover to make sure that the word memoir is clearly in sight when you're looking at the cover of the book, uh, that a content advisory label is added to the inside front cover, and that a list of resources would be added to the back cover to support students' social-emotional needs. Uh, with respect to the other book, this book is Gay by James Dawson. Um, that committee recommended, number one, that we take the 2015 edition and we replace it in the collection with the second edition that was published in 2021. Um, the reason they uh, feel that that is necessary is because the general language regarding transgender non-binary individuals has been updated. General language and phrasing's been revised to be more straightforward and less emotionally charged or biased. The 2021 edition reflects a greater awareness of issues related to sexuality and gender identity, making the work more inclusive. And the author's name has actually been changed and updated to reflect the author's identity and preferred name. Um, they're also recommending that a content advisory label be added to the inside cover of the book as they would in the book Gender Queer. So, uh, with that, that's all I have. I want to thank the committee again. Uh, I think, in my opinion, the process 
uh, really worked well. Uh, one of the things that I think about is that it, it, it pushed these members to read the book from cover to each book from cover to cover. That's what took them so long. They spent many hours um, and not just looking at individual pages out of context. And you know that really does help you shape uh, a different opinion on the value of these books. Um, so I won't rehash things that were said in the audience. Uh, you, you know from my memo where I stand on the issue. Um, so uh, with that, I, I yield the microphone. Well. I want to commend all the students that came and spoke to us tonight. Um, they were quite impressive, and it really speaks to to the community that we have and and the quality of education that we're giving our students. For them to stand up in front of an audience like that and and to speak their own truths was was quite breathtaking and amazing. Thank you. Anybody else, Mrs. Algemo? I just want to echo what my colleague just said about all the speakers that we had today, especially the students who are brave enough to come up and to speak and share their experiences with us. Um, I did read both of these books because I wanted to see for myself what they were about. And I have to say that I was impressed by both books. Um, we, we heard some of the data from the Youth Behavior Risk Survey earlier today, but there are just a couple of things that I want to share and keep in mind. That out of our high school students, the ones who walk these halls every day last year, 25% of them identified as LGBTQ+. And out of those, 19 point, no, I'm, I'm sorry, 24.8 of them say that they have already engaged in sexual intercourse. However, almost 60% of our students have not had conversations with parents or other adult relatives about sexuality or safe sex in the past year. So where are those 60% of our students getting their information? I am not naive enough to know that every single high school student has one of these in their pocket and that they Google everything and they have access to so much misinformation and actual pornography on their phones. There is nothing pornographic in these books. Um, these books are valuable resources for our students, all of our students. When I finished reading them, I handed them to my 13-year-old daughter because regardless of how she identifies, these books will make her a better person. So I fully support the recommendations. Ms. Coleman. Um, I too read both of the books from cover to cover and I absolutely agree with um, the review committee on the subject and keeping them both in the Waltham High School Library. Um, I thought the whole community outreach, whether it be in person today or via email, there was only two that I could count that were against keeping the books. So it was an overwhelming support that these books should be in the library um, for access to students that would like to read them. I think it's great that we're gonna get an updated version for them. Um, I think it would be great even if there was more, if 25% of the students are identifying, I think it would be great to even have more resources in the library. And it was exciting to hear that the PTO is fundraising for them as well. So I just wanna say it was wonderful to hear the community outreach for this, as well as the students and teachers speaking today and all the parents. Um, they were way more, way more articulate than I am. So it was just really impressive and I really appreciate the review committee for putting together this information. Thank you. Mr. Only. Thank you, yes. With the um, amount of uh, emails that arrived <laughs> from yesterday and the night before, as I said, I was watching the Olympics and I kept watching the computer and it kept going up and up and up and up because we had the mask issue which was very important to people. And we had the book. Into and then I had my iPad and was looking up portions of the book 
in in recommendations and the Tennessee business. So um, to see it all come together as well as it did tonight, I'm surprised and and pleased that uh, we were just a few little ripples of different things. And then we got a lesson in the masks and the germs and <laughs> the additional uh, input from people, but it was pretty good. And I commend you, Mayor McCarthy, for, for um, keeping the people um, in place who wanted to, uh, there are times that issues like that or just a whole group of people want to talk and want to agree or get into discussions and things like that. So it went very, very, very well, uh, considering all the, top, the topics. Um, I read about the business in Washington and Virginia when the groups were opposing each other who wanted to keep the books or not, and um, I think it was just handled very well. I was also surprised and pleased that the, the students got involved, and um, I'm thinking that that was with help from the head librarian, maybe with the uh, Gay Straight Alliance, and um, to see the recognition, because there's been stuff floating around the schools with, with the kids, and some who have open conversations with their uh, parents, and some who don't. And so this brings it to a point where people are looking at it as, as something that's very productive. I, w I would just add to the students were amazingly wonderful. They were very impressive. And uh, I can't say enough about their willingness to get up and speak and tell about how they really feel. It was very powerful. And uh, based on that, I think I would like to make a motion that we support keeping the books in Is this a vote? the school library. This is a vote. Second. Motion, is there a second? Second. Okay, roll call, Mr. Trello? Yes. Mrs. Gately? Yes. Mrs. Aljamal? Yes. Ms. Donnelly? Yes. Ms. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Frax? Yes. Okay, I would like to have the floor for a minute. Mayor McCarthy. Now that you have voted, I'm happy that you voted. I'm very happy to hear from all the children, and I'm very happy to hear from all the staff members. I have to say some things because people would say, just keep quiet, Jeanette. I can't, and I'll tell you why. There are two policies that are involved. The first is the library media policy for the selection of library materials, and the other is a school committee policy. So, briefly, I'd like to go over a couple things. We also have another policy that we are involved with. So the superintendent has provided those to us, the policies as well as the library um, bill of rights. And our policy is similar to the library media and policy for selection of materials. Now, I'm not here to offend any child. I'm here to make sure that there's guidance associated with this policy, guidance and the support that children need. With regard to the substantive issue of the complaint and its review by the school, school department, I note for the record that the age of majority in Massachusetts is 18. That is the age that a ch child is deemed as an adult by law. The age of consent, however, is 16 years of age in, in Massachusetts. According to the most recent enrollment provided to us on February 2nd, there were 486 freshmen, 432 sophomores, 412 juniors, and 384 seniors for a total of 1,714 children, students. Generally, the age of fres freshmen varies from 14 to 15, sophomores from 15 to 16, juniors from 16 to 17, and seniors from 17 to 18 plus. Anyone under 18 is considered to be a minor. The superintendent can determine how many children are under the age of 18 and how many children are under the age of 16. From the ages of six to 16, 
school attendance is mandatory. Why do I bring up the issue of minors? I raise these issues because the school districts uh, well, have well established in loco parentis responsibilities, which require school departments to supervise children in school settings, whether indoors or outdoors. I have looked at the material provided by the superintendent and the information provided by the material, materials review committee. I have also asked the superintendent how the books were cataloged. According to the superintendent, one book is shelved under a graphic novel, under autobiography, biography, and memoir, and the other book is shelved under nonfiction with the call number for sexual orientation. I have no personal knowledge if the books in question are factual or not. That is for the librarian and the materials review committee to determine. I have no information provided if there are other books for all genders and all sexual orientations in the school library, whether fiction or nonfiction. I have no information if there are fact-based books regarding sexual orientation and gender by trained professionals, such as physicians, clinicians, psychologists, psychiatrists, or school adjustment counselors, to address all of the needs of all children of various genders and sexual orientation in the school library or in the school curriculum. I have no information whether or not the Materials Review Committee made a determination whether the materials were deemed educationally unsuitable or pervasively vulgar without any reference to personal politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of personal opinion, which is the guidance provided by the United States Supreme Court. I note under the library media policy for selection of library materials and under the school committee's policy, IJL, there are six standards that have to be satisfied. Did the materials review committee determine that those six standard items in both the library and school policies were met? I take, I take specific note of number one, and all six of them are the same, but each of them has a specific item. Maturity level of students, number one. Number three, factual knowledge. Number four, with regard to controversial issues, develop under guidance. In both policies, under guidance is identified and there is no evidence that under guidance was even considered with review of these two books. There's no mention of guidance or supervision in the Library Bill of Rights. What concerns me with all the information we've been provided by the school department is there's no evidence of human involvement, support, or guidance for the individual or individual students for whom these books were written or with regard to the subject matter involved. I heard them talk from their heart tonight. I appreciate that. I just want to make sure they have the support from this school system more than two books in the library. I want to make sure they have the guidance. Sometimes we all know that if you go to a bookstore or a library, People often just look at the back cover to see if it piques their interest. Kids often only look at pictures. They do not read the content. Some students may never get beyond the pictures to the substance of the book. The warning, in my opinion, should be on the front and back covers. Our duty is for the best interests of children. But that does not mean that we have no duty of supervision of all children. Guidance or support are needed for all students. How is the under guidance to be accomplished by the library staff and or the school department staff? And I'm glad that I only made this statement after you voted to keep the books. Because that, to me, is the question. Now, once you determine all those facts, then the law is applied to those facts. Applying the law to the facts, generally you cannot ban books. However, the questions for the Material Review Committee is whether or not the books are educationally suitable 
or unsuitable, or pervasively vulgar or not, without reference to personal politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of personal opinions. There are cases where speech that is vulgar may be inappropriate for children. Who will ensure compliance that the library with the library and school committee policies? Are the other books in this genre cataloged together so there's appropriate guidance and supervision under its policies for all children? My recommendations going forward is that that supervision be identified, that guidance, that love, that support for all children be identified so that as a policymaker for those policies, and I'd like to say what they are. One, specifically, the li library media program purports to provide materials that will enrich and support the curriculum and personal needs of the users, taking into effect, taking into consideration, excuse me, their varied interests, ability, and learning styles. Two, provide materials that will stimulate growth in factual knowledge, literary appreciation, aesthetic values, and ethical standards. Three, provide a background of information which will enable pupils to make judgments in their daily lives. Four, provide materials on opposing sides of controversial issues so that the users may develop, under guidance, the practice of critical analysis. Five, provide materials which realistically represent our plur pluralistic society and reflect the contributions made by various groups and individuals to our American heritage. And lastly, place principle above personal opinion and reason above prejudice in the selection of materials of the highest quality in order to ensure assure a comprehensive library collection appropriate to the users. Now the school committee's policy is the same, but if you actually look at what they reviewed and what the standards are, there are several pages. But in the request for reconsideration, there are documents. And these are the questions that are asked. What do you object to? Be specific, pages, frames. What do you believe is the theme or purpose of this material? How do you feel might be the result of a student using this material? For what age group would you recommend this material? Is there anything good in the material? Please comment. Would you care to recommend other school library material to, of the same subject and format? And then the complainant is supposed to sign it. Okay. So when you go back, the checklist includes what is the overall purpose of the material? Is the purpose accomplished? Is the author competent and qualified in the file? Field, excuse me, it says filed. What is the reputation ad significance of the author and publisher in the field? And it says filed again. Is the material up to date? Are the information sources well documented? Are translations retelling faithful to original? Does the material promote educational goals and objectives of the curriculum of the Walton Public Schools? Is it appropriate to the level of instruction intended? Are the illustrations appropriate to the subject and age levels? Is the content of this material well presented by proving adequate scope, range, and depth, and continuity? Does the material give a new discussion or a direction to its subject? Review the sources, the recommendation. So all of these things are in there. The only thing I didn't hear is what supervision will be provided by the library, by the school department, and most importantly, after listening to the, all of the testimony tonight, what sources do we have to actually help the children aside from these two books? And see, that I have to say, why? Because it, it's our responsibility. You can disagree with my, my recitation of the policies. I'm only reading from the library's policy and the Walton School Committee's policy. And it is our duty of supervision. 
Now, we trust the people that work for us to do this. But there some, come time, sometimes comes things in life where you have to ask questions. And I'd ask this question directly, and I don't want an answer tonight. I want everybody to say, are you providing the appropriate guidance so that children have the guidance and the ability to do critical thinking? Because I received one letter from a parent, and I know personally the experience. And the person was against banning the books, and it was to encourage more communication, more research, more guidance, more collective um, involvement with the staff, with the children, to move them to a point where they feel safe, all of them, in a school district. But I also believe it's the responsibility of the school department to ask questions whether or not there is proper supervision. Because if you give something, even the Bible, if you give the Bible to someone and they don't know the things, they would not understand all of what the Bible says. Because if you take the Bible literally, it could be offensive to some people, to all kinds of people. But the supervision hasn't been answered. And my point is, I trust the people in Waltham. I do. But I don't think it's not relevant to ask the questions if our policy complies with federal law, state law. And I believe banning a book is wrong. But I also believe that some students need. Some people can get it right away. Some people have already been experienced in more than what we'll ever know. But the real issue is, if they are feeling suicidal, and I heard it more than one, if they are feeling disenfranchised in any way, any student, any of our 1,700 students, I want to know what is the supervision and support to help them. Thank you very much for listening. Now. Any other items you like to talk about? New business? Uh, Mr. Frasca. No. Uh, no, I was just going to say fiscal matters. The bills, the fiscal updates. Why don't you take it, Mr. Frasca? Motion to pay the bills. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. No business. Items for future meetings. We just did no business. Anybody? Motion to attain, entertain, motion to adjourn at 11.28 this evening. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Yes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.